Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Nelson, and I serve on the board of Fair Vote Minnesota because I've come to believe that in order to make our democracy more responsive to the needs of the people it serves, no matter what cause we are passionate about, our cause needs to be election reform. I wanna begin by giving special thanks to our sponsor, Best Buy. Thank you, Best Buy. And the co-hosts and fellow board members who made today's event possible. I think many of them, if not all of them, are on the line. I'm just going to briefly mention them. Marilyn Carlson Nelson, Penny and Bill George, Carla Ekdahl and Peter Hutchinson, Blanche and Thane Hawkins, Mark Gorlick and Lynn Broadus, Lois Quam, Sam Boren and Steve King, Alan Kathy Lensmeyer, Mike Osterholm, Gail Dorfman, and Jeff Peterson. Thanks to all of you. And I'd also like to recognize the elected officials and candidates who are with us. Senator Ann Rest, Senator Jim Carlson, Senator Melissa Franzen, Senator Sandy Pappas, Senator Steve Kwodzinski, and Representative Steve Elkins, who was the chief author of the Ranked Choice Voting Local Options legislation. Thank you, Representative Elkins. Also Representatives Kristen Bonner, Kelly Morrison and Lori Pryor. Thanks for being here with us. And then lastly, we have several candidates here with us and I wanna give a shout out to House candidates, Caitlin Cahill, Ann Mosey, Liz Rayner, Joshua Prine, and Senate candidates, Alita Borod, Ann Johnson Stewart, Gretchen Piper, Bonnie Westland, John Olson, Chris Brazelton, and Hennepin County candidate, Devonna Pittman. All of the names I've, I've cited are individuals who support ranked choice voting. And I wanna thank all of them for standing with us and examining what is not working in our democracy and being willing to make changes. Our nation has always been a work in progress and this moment is no different. There are more than 450 people on this call today, and we thank you for joining this critical conversation about how we can create a racially just democracy and joining the urgency around accomplishing this goal, made all the more urgent and painful by recent events in both Wisconsin and Minnesota. So why are we here? We're here because a worldwide movement for racial justice has been ignited by the murder of George Floyd right here in Minneapolis. And the response to George Floyd's death shouldn't be a surprise. The lack of responsiveness to the issues of systemic racism in our criminal justice system and in nearly every American institution has gone on for far too long. And here we are yet again witness to additional brutal events. Again, the police shooting of Jacob Black, Blake, a black man in, in the back in front of his three children. And while you know we don't know all the circumstances surrounding this event, what we do know is that state violence against black Americans is, is just far too common and is part and parcel of a larger systemic set of barriers that black Americans face on a daily basis. These events are also painful and repeated reminders of a government that historically and today places black Americans in a category of less than. And while we've made progress since the passage of the Civil Rights Act nearly 60 years ago, we still have a long way to go to ensure racial equality and a responsive political system. As our panelist Danielle Allen wrote in the Washington Post in June, Despite reform efforts in this city or that, our political institutions have been fundamentally non-responsive. They failed to effect plainly needed change. For this time to be different, we need not only the specific reforms to policing, but also a bold and comprehensive project to constitute a healthy social contract in which we are all committed to one another and where our political institutions are responsive to us, delivering effective governance. So that's what we're here today to talk about, about the important and timely recommendations of a bipartisan commission 
called the Practice of Democratic Citizenship, which was a project of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The project was called Our Common Purpose, Reinventing American Democracy for the 21st Century. So this report that was put together by a distinguished commission proposes reforms to transform our political institutions and make them more inclusive and more responsive to all Americans. And amongst these reforms that are recommended is ranked choice voting. So one word about ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is a simple way to change, a simple change to the way that we vote that allows voters to rank their preferences on the ballot and gives us more choice and more power in our democracy. It is more inclusive. It's proven to increase the diversity of political leadership and it ensures elected leaders are responsive to a majority of voters, not just a narrow base of special interests. For more than two decades, Fair Vote Minnesota has led the movement to empower Minnesota voters with more voice and more choice in our elections and democracy. We've trained and mobilized thousands of volunteers, educated hundreds of thousands of voters, and secured breakthrough wins for ranked choice voting in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and St. Louis Park. I'm excited to see ranked choice voting on local ballots in Bloomington and Minnetonka, and on statewide ballots in several states this November. Ranked choice voting is a people-powered movement that holds the promise of breaking through our political gridlock that's holding back progress on racial justice and every other issue facing our nation. It, along with other reforms we'll hear about today, can transform our democracy for the better. Now, before we jump into the panel, I want to introduce an honored guest who is here with us today, Senator Tina Smith. We are so grateful for your support of ranked choice voting, Senator Smith and so glad that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to be a part of today's event. Senator Smith. Well, um, thank you. Make sure I'm not muted. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much, Kim. And thank you for that um, wonderful and thoughtful way of framing up this conversation. Um, I think that um, we are in a moment of real reckoning about whether our country is going to choose to live up to the full potential that is promised in our constitution or whether we are going to continue to turn away from the deep um, racial injustice and, and um, racism that unfortunately is a through line through too many of our civic institutions. And so this conversation feels particularly important uh, to me in this moment. And I'm so grateful for the leadership of everybody on this call. I want to particularly call out um, Jean Massey and uh, Fair Vote Minnesota um, for your um, intrepid and determined and dedicated work to advance the, uh, the promise and the goals of ranked choice voting. Um, I have experienced Jean's um, determination firsthand because when we were first advancing ranked choice voting in Minneapolis, I was at that moment the chief of staff for Mayor Ryback and was uh, able to be in that role when we figured out how for the first time to implement ranked choice voting. And I will never forget that. And I think that it is, um, it is an example of what we're able to do. Um, even when, Jean, how many people told us that it was not gonna work, that it wasn't gonna happen, that it was gonna take us you know, months to count the votes. And, um, and uh, we proved them wrong. So that was a, that was a great moment. Um, and I'm just delighted to be here with Danielle Allen and Stephen Heinz and the Commission on the Practice of Democratic uh, Citizenship. Thank you for joining this conversation. And Sandra, it's always wonderful to see you. Wonderful to see you. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. So um, I am really grateful for the work that you all are doing to strengthen the machinery of our democracy and our civic culture uh, founded on free and fair access to the right to register to vote, to cast your ballot, to cast our ballot, and then to be sure that our vote is counted and that it matters. And in Minnesota, you know, we have a strong civic culture around voting. We are proud of our, of, of our voting turnout and we, are, we will often tell you uh, that we have the highest voter turnout of any state in the nation over the last two elections. And we're rightly proud of that. But 
even as we say this, even as I say this, we know that not everyone who is eligible, eligible to vote casts a vote. And we also know uh, that Minnesota struggles with the long-term historic impacts of systemic racism, which is why we have some of the worst disparities, some of the worst discrimination for black and brown and indigenous people, people of color, when it comes to our criminal justice system, to our housing systems, to um, healthcare, home ownership. So in this moment, we think about how voting plays into this moment, this important moment in our country. And voting is our most fundamental right um, in our democracy. But when citizens lose faith that their vote is going to count, and when people become disconnected from their power and their power to influence the outcomes of their communities and the power even to be connected to one another, um, when voter suppression in all of its ugly forms keep people from exercising their rights to vote, then our very democracy is undermined. And you know, when I'm out talking to people about voting in elections, which I do a lot, I often tell them and just remind everybody that democracy is hard work. It doesn't just happen because it is in our constitution. Democracy is an action word. It is something that requires constant tending. And I have to say, just to be frank, um, this feels more important in this moment than ever I, that I can remember in my lifetime. I mean, to be honest, we have a president in this moment who is actively undermining the integrity of our national elections and even saying that he may not abide by the results of this election. And this is corrosive. This, is, this corrosively undermines the basic trust in our democracy that is fundamental to whether our democracy works or not. So what do we do about this? Well, let me just say briefly that I am working very hard in the United States Senate to make sure that the US Postal Service is able to do the work that it needs to do in the midst of this most important election. Working hard to make sure that local election officials have the support that they need so that they're able to allow people and help people to vote whether they choose to vote in person or whether they choose to vote um, by mail. Um, it is extremely important that we pass H.R. 1, the For the People Act, which will support access to vote, combat voter discrimination, curb the influence of dark money and election interference by foreign powers. This is extremely important, particularly since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act of 19, of 2000, voted the Voting Rights Act. But we also need to look at new ways to make the machinery of our democracy work better for people, and especially people of color. And that is why I'm so eager to hear about this report today um, and what you can tell us about how ranked choice voting can help us address these systemic challenges um, with racial equity in our election system and in our democracy. You know, I have seen firsthand the benefits of ranked choice voting in my hometown of Minneapolis, and I have been a strong supporter of ranked choice voting and the rights of states and local governments to choose ranked choice voting to elect their representatives. So I am very eager to see how we can use this as a new way, but a way that is tried and trust tested, as Jean and many others can tell you, to strengthen the machinery of our democracy. And I look forward to being a partner with you in this work. I'm so grateful for all of your leadership. And I wanna thank you for being a part of this uh, great journey in democracy <laughs> that we find ourselves on in this moment. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again, Senator Smith, for your partnership and your longtime support of Ranked Choice Voting. At this point, I'd like to introduce the powerhouse behind Ranked Choice Voting in Minnesota and the moderator of today's discussion, Jean Massey. Jean has been working on democracy form for over a decade, and her track record includes winning campaigns in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and St. Louis Park, Minnesota, all of which have helped foster greater statewide interest in ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting advocates from across the country turn to Jean to deepen their understanding of RCV and hone winning strategies. Jean engages diverse and cross-sector leaders in her work, including social justice organizations, electoral reformers, and the business community. In the wake of the George Floyd mur murder, Jean didn't sit on the sidelines. She honored George Floyd by marching in solidarity, reaching out to allies working on criminal justice reform, and joining them in pushing for restoration of felon voting rights in the Minnesota legislature. Jean not only 
talks, she walks the talk. Over to you, Jane. Thank you so much, Kim, and welcome everybody. And uh, I just want to say what an honor it is to be with all of you in the audience and everyone here on the panel, and to really honor the work that all of you are doing in the democracy space, which is so important right now. And thank you, Senator Smith, for those uh, very powerful opening remarks from you and your service to help implement ranked choice voting in Minneapolis. I remember that year very well. And uh, with your determination to make sure that the process went well in Minneapolis, it really set the stage for the kind of quality of election reform we can do. And the, Minnesota, the Minneapolis model, quite frankly, has been exported around the country because of the good work that you have done in the city. So thank you for that. And thank you for your support. It is so important, not only here in Minnesota, but at the national level. And let me just take a minute to recognize Kim Nelson. She is one of the most distinguished business leaders in Minnesota who's helping lead democracy forward. She got involved in our work at an event about a year ago at the Carlson School, where she heard business, Harvard business professor Michael Porter and business executive Catherine Gale speak about the need for political reform. She was so excited by what she heard that she found me afterwards and said she wanted to get involved. And she didn't waste any time. <laughs> Within months, she was already organizing the business community she knows for ranked choice voting. And by the end of the legislative session, she was delivering a statement from more than a dozen Minnesota business leaders to the state legislature at 11 p.m. no less. That's Kim Nelson. She's a corporate executive for nearly 30 years at General Mills before retiring. And she currently serves on several corporate and community boards. And we couldn't be more fortunate than to have her on the Fair Vote Minnesota board and helping us lead this charge forward. Thank you, Kim, for your uh, extraordinary service to this effort. I also want to thank the amazing team at Fair Vote Minnesota and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences who pulled together today's event. It was no easy task. We have more than 450 people registering for the event and we're very excited. And we are so grateful for the efforts to make this event possible and accessible to such a wide and diverse audience. So now it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce our panelists for today's discussion, Danielle Allen, Stephen Hines, and Sandra Samuels. I'll start by introducing uh, Danielle Allen. Welcome virtually to Minneapolis. Uh, we really thought it was important to host an event here in Minneapolis following the events of George Floyd, and, and uh, we really wanted to ground this discussion um, physically here, and we welcome you virtually uh, to our city. I heard Danielle speak at, to, at an event just a couple of days ago for the Ranked Choice Voting Ballot Measure statewide in, in the state of Massachusetts. And I'm just so inspired. She's a standout and one of the nation's most prominent experts on democracy reform. Danielle is a Harvard University professor and she's the director of the Harvard's Edmonds J. Safra Center for Ethics. And she's also principal investigator for Harvard's Democracy Knowledge knowledge project, which is like an incubator program uh, for civic curriculum, which is a very necessary project right now. And she's an acclaimed author on justice and democracy and citizenship in general. You'll hear her on all kinds of media outlets, including, including on the Ezra Klein podcast. And he had noted that she was one of his all time favorites. So you're in for a good show today with Danielle. Thank you, Danielle, for coming here. Real pleasure. Stephen Hines, is uh, the president and CEO of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I had the opportunity to meet with Stephen back in 2013 when we were getting to roll out ranked choice voting in the first open mayoral election here in Minneapolis. We were seeking funds to do voter education and outreach and he readily responded. He knew the power of, of ranked choice voting back then and he provided those resources and it only kept the ability of Minneapolis to really showcase how well we could implement ranked choice voting here in our city. So we thank you for those resources and we thank you for coming here today. It is of note uh, that Stephen has been a long time electoral and democracy visionary. He was a co-founder co of Demos, which is one of the nation's most well-known think tanks to promote a multiracial and democratic society. So thank you for your service. And last but not least, Sandra Samuels, here locally, 
um, has been a longtime colleague of mine and a friend of Fair Vote Minnesota as a community leader and a voice from uh, in North Minneapolis. She is president and CEO of the Northside Achievement Zone and has been for quite some time, better known as NAS, a nationally recognized 43 partner collaborative, <laughs> uh, really focused on ensuring um, ending multiracial poverty through education and family stability on the Minneapolis North Side. She is a vocal leader in her community and is very committed to the advancement of the Minneapolis North Side families in academic, economic, and civic achievement. Thank you all for coming today. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to jump into questions. As uh, both Senator Smith and Kim noted, this is a very tough time. It's a very sensitive time. And the conversation we're about to have, I really want us all to help understand how we can um, be inspired with some hope in promoting our democracy moving forward. So let me begin with this question, and I'll give you each a chance to respond to it. So many Americans, particularly Black and Brown and Indigenous Americans, are not treated as equal citizens and are marginalized by our institutions and our culture. We have seen this viscerally with the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and now the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. American CR system is not working and it's unfair with policing, but at a broader level. How can this report and its recommendations answer those calls for justice and provide concrete ways to improve our democratic institutions and culture so they are responsive and representative to all Americans? Uh, Danielle, could we start with you? Sure. No, thank you so much, Jane, and thank you for your leadership in this important conversation. This is such a painful and exhausting moment, really. And I can imagine it feels hard to, in the midst of pain, want to do something like talk about electoral reform. The urgency of the moment um, may make it seem like we should be talking about demilitarization of the police, de-escalation tactics, the kinds of things that would immediately make policing look different. We think it's really important, though, to recognize that achieving those concrete substantive changes in policing and the administration of justice depends on effective governance. The two are tightly linked. We actually know what we need for better policing. We've known for a long time. People have been lifting their voices, articulating grievances for a decade with regard to policing. So the core problem is actually a lack of sufficiently responsive governance, sufficiently responsive political institutions. That means we face the question of how do we fix that? That's what our commission report has really tackled. How can we have responsive political institutions? Ranked choice voting is one of our number one recommendations. There are 31 recommendations in our report. We'll talk about more of them. But we did in the report center the issue of voting. And for African Americans, for indigenous communities, for communities of color, Voting restrictions have been a steady, persistent pattern of our experience of the American Constitution, of American democracy. So we believe the time has truly come to change that once and for all, to deliver an electoral system that addresses issues of gerrymandering, that addresses issues of felony disfranchisement, and that addresses elections where you don't really have choices or where people can be elected into office with less than a majority of the vote. All of those things are problems that keep our institutions from being responsive to the good ideas that people have and the real felt complaints that they express. So ranked choice voting, again, we'll talk more about that, is really at the top of our list. But the report does deliver a vision for an inclusive, responsive, empowering electoral system. Uh, thank you for that uh, uh, very articulate response, Danielle. We can't wait to, to hear more about some of the depths of that report. Stephen, uh, can you add to that your perspective of the importance of the work that you've just done? Sure, and thanks again for having us and, and congratulations on the pathbreaking work you've been doing in Minnesota all these years. It's just so impressive. Um, you know, I consider myself to be a follower of Frederick Douglass and Frederick Douglass knew fundamentally that politics mattered first and foremost, and that black power resides in the vote and in the ability to fully participate in self-government. And yet the system has not enabled that. In fact, the system has prevented it. And so the kinds of reforms that are in this report, which include reforms of the electoral system, 
include ideas about how to improve the effectiveness and openness of government institutions, include much needed revitalization of our political and civic culture, and the sense that we share as Americans a need to revitalize our own commitment to constitutional democracy and to one another. And I think that's where the change resides. It is really in achieving Frederick Douglass's vision of, a, of an empowerment of black and brown Americans to not only vote, but to participate fully in self-government. Oh, great. Thank you, Stephen. And Sandra, um, would you like to share some thoughts on this as well? Yes, and Jean, I want to jump in on your fan club. Thank you so much for, for leading the way for us to really have this democratic movement that is inclusive and just in, in, in Minnesota. Um, yeah, you know, um, Senator Smith said it really best around, you know, we are the land of disparities, of racial disparities and home ownership and income, you know, in incarceration, in health, in education, which, you know, is, is my passion. And, and I've struggled with like we know the policies, just like we know with policing, we know what could change this state and, and eradicate those disparities. And, and the thing George Floyd is doing, I think for many of us who are African-American, black and brown in this state and in this city is, is we've always known uh, when the George Floyd happened, that was the tip of the iceberg, of the racist iceberg. The, the, the other part of the iceberg is big, right? And it, and, it's, and it is all consuming. And as a leader of a nonprofit in the neighborhood where I work, I also play, I raise children, no nonprofit can make our democracy work. Um, and we can do all this great work on the ground. We can get all the philanthropists um, that there are out there, but if systems and policies are not representative and doing the will of the people, like the people that I partner with, we are net, what we're doing is for naught. And so I'm excited about the, the power of uh, ranked choice voting uh, to really transform the injustices. Oh, well, thank you all for those very heart heartfelt responses. Uh, we'll just keep digging right into all of this. Um, Danielle and Stephen, with respect to the, the groundbreaking work that you've done on on your report, it really does highlight so many of the problems that we're facing, but also providing big solutions to rebuild our democratic institutions. And you start out your report with a pretty startling statistic. Most Americans agree with us. 61% you identified know that we have big problems in our society and are demanding big change. So we start these reforms knowing that we now have the people helping make that happen. I'm curious what really most motivated you personally to be involved in this work and why it's so important to you and why should it be important to everyday Americans? Stephen, do you wanna go first on that one? Sure, so, well, personally, I'm a, I'm a guy who came of age in the 1960s. And I was inspired by both the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. And during college, made the decision that I was gonna try to pursue a career in politics. And so I spent the first 15 years of, of my working life in politics and in state government, um, trying to make democracy work for people. And then in 1990, inspired by the revolutions in Central and Eastern Europe, I moved to Prague and for a decade worked with the leaders of the newly free countries of that region as they were building the new democracies after 40 years of communist oppression. And inspired by that and my prior work in, in American politics, I came back to the US and helped start Demos, which you mentioned earlier, Jean. So I would say, um, and then it, you know, in philanthropy, supporting quality of democracy is a fundamental priority of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. So I would say in essence, democracy has been a fundamental focus of my entire life. And I am more worried about our democracy today than I have ever been. And it's been through the work of this commission working with Danielle, who's such an extraordinary leader and our third co-chair, Eric Liu, the president of Citizen University, and the rest of this very diverse 
commission of 35 extraordinary Americans at a time when I am and many others, as you've noted, are so deeply worried about our democracy. This work is what has given me hope. And it's not only hope, it's also given us an action plan. And it has demonstrated that now is the time to act. Great, thank you, Stephen. Danielle, what, what has motivated you to get so involved in the depths of our democracy? No, it's, it's a great and important question. And it's a pretty basic answer. It's, I love my country. It's that fundamental. And I will say one of the incredible pleasures of working on the commission was to discover how broadly shared that feeling is just at that basic level of life in the heart. We did our usual work as a commission, commissioning experts to write reports and so forth. But much more importantly, we ran listening sessions all over the country that really connected to that statistic you read out, sort of 61% of Americans would like to see change. And as we went around the country, we asked people both what they thought they shared with other Americans, and we asked them what they hoped for. And there was an interesting paradox. So when you ask people what they thought they shared with others, everybody said more or less nothing. I can't think of anything I share. So we sort of were learning that people feel like they share nothing. That's what we share paradoxically. But at the same time that people were saying that, over and over and over again, people were expressing love of country. And people can love the country for different reasons. Some people love the physical beauty, the geography. People love the people. People love the place they grew up. They love our ideals, our tradition. Everybody can also see the wrongs, the history of challenges and difficulties. And we're sort of stuck in reconciling that love of our country with the pain our country also causes us. So for me, the motivation is really about working through the pain driven by the love to activate that love for everybody so that we can, as Stephen said, rebuild a culture where we're committed to each other, where we start from the beginning knowing we will not abandon anybody. This country is for everybody. We are all of equal worth and we can do this together. So for me, the great joy of the work was to find that motivation across the board. We talked to people in Maine, we talked to Naval Cadets, we had the pleasure of visiting with people in Minneapolis and St. Louis Park. And I also understand one of your city leaders there, Nadia Mohammed, was an influential voice with the community we spoke to, Somali refugee women. She was elected by ranked choice voting. And so that was a great example here in Minneapolis of how voices were coming to the surface. We were hearing from people reflecting the fact that ranked choice voting was making a difference, opening up political conversation here. But everywhere we went, we heard love of country. So I found that my personal motivation connected to what I was hearing from everybody else also. Yeah, thank you, Danielle. And Sandra, what, what's inspiring you to do the, the tough work you're doing in the community? Yeah, it's, um, it's exactly what Danielle said around love of country. And, and for me, that means love of my neighbors. And, um, you know, I live and work in a community that has, we, we kind of are the vortex of every racial disparity that this state is so embarrassed by, right? And, but I know like that when I compare America to other countries, I did Peace Corps in, uh, in Botswana, Africa. Oh, I did too, I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> hey, you're our, our PCV. Um, I knew I liked you, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, I, but I realized there, while I loved Africa and my heritage, right, as a descendant of, of enslaved Africans, um, I said, there was so many things that I said, man, oh, I love home, <laughs> right? And, and that, that I could actually, for my, with my neighbors, I could challenge freely um, discrimination. I could challenge freely what doesn't work for um, population, whole populations of people. And so, you know, I, I'm so inspired by our ancestors who, who fought to make this country what we say it is on paper. I love the Constitution. I love the preamble to the Constitution, we the people. And every generation has to take this democratic um, 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 government, which is more a movement, and move that ball forward for the next generation. And, and I know right now the, the weight of the injustices of America, are the, the boulder is in this community. We, we got many across the, the state, but in North Minneapolis, the boulder's here. And we, that only through changes to our democratic process is that boulder gonna be lifted. 
And so I'm hopeful, Jean, very hopeful. Great. Well, you've inspired, I'm sure, all 400 plus people listening to you to, to get involved in helping really do something about moving our democracy forward. Those are very inspiring uh, uh, responses from all of you. Uh, Danielle, let me ask a little bit more deeply about ranked choice voting because I, I heard you say when uh, you were on the call with uh, Massachusetts a couple of days ago, you said our democracy is not living up to our expectations of our founding framers and we need to fix that. And you also said ranked choice voting is the single most important reform we can do. Can you explain how our system is failing, some of the mechanics of that and how ranked choice voting is a solution? to that problem and how specifically it can foster more responsiveness and representation? No, thank you. Thank you for that question. I always come back to the words of the Declaration of Independence. And in fact, not the most famous words actually, but the most important words. The purpose of our political institutions, the Declaration says, is to secure the safety and happiness of the people safety and happiness of the people. That's the aspiration. So we always have to measure our institutions by whether they're delivering that. Look around, we look at the COVID crisis, 170,000 people dead since February and rising because our governments have not delivered the public health response that we need. Policing, again, we have been advocating for changes for decades. There is a boulder, as Sandra said, that boulder that people experience when they can define a problem, they can point out the pathways to solutions, their voices are not being heard, that boulder is non-responsive governance. So we have to change that. And what, what's keeping our government from being responsive? We know the basics, the polarization and the structure of relationship between primaries um, and the main election means small impassioned groups of the most partisan folks um, can dominate the political conversation and keep solutions that could pull us together off the table. Money in politics, same thing, can keep solutions that bring us together off the table. So all of those mechanisms that are keeping us away from common purpose solutions are the ones that we have to undo. I think ranked choice voting is the single most important one at, at the get-go because we can make that change at the city level, at the state level, we can pursue it at the federal level too, but we can get so far so fast at the other levels that we can bring change there and then drive change at the federal level where it's harder to drive change. So I think ranked choice voting is huge because I do think it just, it lifts the boulder off. It brings voices into our political arena. It empowers people. It brings in a diverse, more diverse range of candidates. Uh, women fare better under ranked choice voting mechanisms. Candidates campaign in a more positive way. They have to campaign to be people's second and third choice as well as their first choice. So they really have to carve out that space for again, those common purpose solutions that can pull us together. In some sense, it means everybody has to work towards the aspiration of building a super majority, not a 47% not a of the vote you know, to get, get through. And that would be transformative for our politics. Oh, that was so helpful. Stephen, do you want to add anything about ranked choice voting there and perhaps speak to a couple of other reforms you find really important in the work that you did with the commission? Sure. I, I endorse everything that has been said about ranked choice voting. I think it is transformative. Um, but we know there's no single silver bullet to fix what ails our democracy. And I think one of the things that is distinguishing about the work of the commission is in fact, we know that work in only one dimension of our democracy is also insufficient. So while all of the reforms that we lay out in the report for electoral system reform, for improving the effectiveness of government institutions and all that sphere, which are absolutely essential, they are insufficient unless we also pay attention to the need to build a new civic culture of commitment to each other to the love of country that Daniel has spoken about, and that we strengthen the role of civil society, the, the work of nonprofit organizations like the one Sandra is leading so brilliantly in Minneapolis, and the work of Fair Vote Minnesota. It's, it's citizens coming together in civil society institutions. These are the places where we learn the habits of the heart of what it means to be a citizen in a democracy, and how we work together to produce the kind of common sense and common purpose uh, solutions that Daniel has referred to. So, but a few other things that I think are really important recommendations that we've suggested, and some of them are 
pretty bold. Uh, we recommend, for example, adding 50 seats to the US House of Representatives to make that body more representative again than it is now. You know, the original constitutional limit was one representative for every 30,000 constituents. And now we have one representative for something like 740,000 constituents across the country. Adding seats to the House also adds automatically seats to the Electoral College, which would help you know, um, reduce some of the distortions in the Electoral College. So I think that's fundamentally important. We've also proposed moving to 18-year term limits for justices of the US Supreme Court and, and what are known as regular appointments, meaning a, a schedule of appointments so that a, one president during his or her four-year term can only appoint two justices. And over time, this means that one party or the other will have less opportunity to dominate the membership of the court. Um, we have recommended um, a, an expectation of national service or community service, perhaps is the better term, by all Americans, young Americans, with a stipend so that everybody can afford it. But a sense that this is a way to build that culture of commitment to each other is by working with each other in service to our communities and to our country. Um, so there are all kinds of uh, important recommendations. I guess one other um, focus that I would mention is that we know that the, the media environment, the information environment in which we now are struggling as citizens has become uh, highly fractioned, highly distorted. Um, we are exposed to a great deal of misinformation. Um, it's very hard to break out of the cocoons that we all live in, in terms of what information we listen to or receive. And there need to be some fundamental reforms to social media. And while we have some initial ideas in that regard, I think the thrust of our report is there just needs to be a lot more study and a lot more work to understand both the positive but the very real negative impacts of social media on the quality of our politics and our political discourse. So as I, as I said, you know, I think one of the really important features of this work has been that we've worked in these three domains, political institutions, elections, government agencies, civic society, where, where citizens learn those important habits and work together and solve problems, and culture, where we have to just understand the notions deep in our hearts about the norms and the values that are what the democracy actually stands on. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, boy, I wish this were really a workshop all day long to get into all of the our, our common uh, purpose report. It's really amazing. And if in the audience you haven't had a chance to look at the full analysis and the full set of recommendations, I strongly encourage you all to do that. It's a, it's a roadmap for the future of our democracy. And I'm on that road and I'm hoping everybody is. So uh, thank you for that incredible work. I think we're, we're running just a little bit short on time and I want to get to a few questions from the audience. So let's uh, take some questions from the audience. If you've not queued them up yet in the chat box, please do. Um, we won't have time for probably more than a couple, but I'm hoping that uh, we can uh, answer a few top ones that you might have. Uh, let's start with you, Sandra, in answering uh, this important question. It's top of mind in most people's uh, uh, minds about this election season uh, right now. We need to increase voter registration and prevent voter suppression. Any ideas for action on that one? <laughs> right <laughs> with voting. <laughs> and? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it is, it's all hands on deck right now. Um, we have to educate um, our communities and like, you know, get out there like by any means necessary. I know here on the north side, we're, we're which is disproportionately African American um, and disproportionately, um, we have the, one of the lowest voter turnouts unless there's a candidate that people are excited by. So we had one of the highest ones when, of course, President Obama um, was on the ballot. So we know that makes a difference. And, and of course, you know, a lot of people call, a lot of people in my neighborhood call Minneapolis, many hopeless. And so we have to have a system that restores that hope. But right now it's about getting out and, um, you know, getting on Zoom, you know, doing what, being safe, 
right? Because we're also disproportionately being impacted by Rona, right? Um, but getting out, being safe, making the calls, and we are right now strategizing. And like, just, Jean, this is for us, one of the most important elections uh, coming up. And so I don't have a panacea, except we're mobilizing and we're, we're getting out and, and on Zoom. Yes, and so many other organizations are. If, if anything, we're very hopeful by how many people are engaged in the process of helping make sure everyone has the opportunity to vote. So that alone is inspiring. Uh, Stephen and Danielle, uh, are there some key recommendations from the report that really focus on voter suppression? Well, we um, do have a number of recommendations with regard to, to the whole uh, process of voting in America. and combating voter suppression is critical. Um, and we've seen, you know, all across the country efforts to restrict the access to the ballot, um, keep people from exercising their fundamental democratic right. I mean, it just is so outrageous um, that we just have to do this work. And, you know, I, I want to say one, one other thing. It, we, we all share the sense of urgency, the sense of crisis. But I also want to say, I think this is a year of extraordinary opportunity. And I'm actually quite excited and, and quite inspired by the fact that we have the opportunity to really advance change this year because the nation's attention because of the pandemic, because of the brutal reminders of racial injustice in this country, the nation's attention is focused on the urgent need to change and to reform and to create a democracy that will help us be the country we have promised to be since our founding. And I think that is hugely exciting and very motivating. And I hope it will be for many, many Americans as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Danielle? I think what I'd love to add is the fact that our commission um, was bipartisan, cross ideological, transpartisan, however you want to describe it. And we found in that broad spectrum of conversation, consensus around the need to defend the right to vote. So we actually found bipartisan consensus around mail-in voting, for example, as an emergency measure in the context of the pandemic. And we found consensus around restoration of voting rights when felon, folks with felony convictions returned to the community. So it's really important to underscore that there is a bipartisan audience out there with an appetite for protection of the vote. And so for me, as we all do our work on the vote, figuring out how to make sure that all of those who may be on the other side of a political conversation, but do care about the vote are also part of that conversation to protect the vote, it just couldn't be more important. We really have to keep this as broad based and national conversation as possible and reestablish a universal commitment to protecting the right to vote. Well, for sure, the crisis has inspired so many people to action, and that is giving us great hope. I'm going to ask a, a final question, then we'll have to move on to our concluding remarks because it's, uh, we're, we're running up on the hour. And the next question is about action. It comes from a teacher. She teaches or he teaches at a community college and would love to know a way to bring students along to the work of this project. How can we bring the concept of ranked choice voting to the table at local, state, and national elections? Uh, Stephen, perhaps we could start with you on that one. Well, I was going to suggest that Danielle is really the person to ask because she has been such a leader in civic education and she is an educator herself. And I, I want to give the floor to Danielle. Great. Danielle? Well, I will say we actually just uh, in July released a 10 hour civic education course with Harvard X that might be of interest and I'm happy to share information about that. Um, although if you Google Harvard X, and I think it's just called civic engagement in US constitutional democracy. Um, that's a kind of foundation place, I would say. And then I would say a second thing would be, in fact, just go ahead and assign our report. I know that sounds crazy. <laughs> and it, you know, but it's, it's also divided into chunks. One could assign chunks of it, maybe the introduction and the section on ranked choice voting, for example. Um, and I think one can build conversation circles around the report. And that in itself would be an incredibly important conversation or contribution to this conversation. So we really want people to digest the idea that there isn't a silver bullet. We have to work on institutions and civil society and organizations at the same time. And then we want people to really sort of dig into one particular thing, for example, ranked choice voting and think through how does that affect the rest of the electoral system? 
how does that affect how people get involved in politics with their civil society organizations? There's more work to build alliances. You pull more organizations in. Think through how it affects culture. It produces a kind of moderating effect on campaigning. So that's the kind of exercise we're hoping to uh, have people go through. Um, and I'm sure we would be happy to follow up with you and if you know talk with you about how to get materials to your students uh, for the classroom. Oh, one, I, I might just add one quick specific idea, which is that I think the classroom is a great place to do simulations of ranked choice voting. You know, you can you can run simulations and see how it works in real time. And I think that would be fun for students as well as very educational. Yeah. Now I hear Danielle talk often about using ranked choice voting in everyday life. We do it unconsciously, really. <laughs> We're ranking all the time, but we can deliberately do it and educate our, our neighbors and our friends and our family. Uh, about this concept in a pretty simple fashion. Thank you for that. I want to note for the audience that a link to the commission's report is in the chat box. You can find it there and copy and paste it and go to it right after this event and dig into it a little bit more. And um, Sondra, uh, perhaps we could begin with you to give some closing remarks. Perhaps you'd um, bring this curriculum to uh, the, the partnership you're doing at NAS and uh, inspire <laughs> North Minneapolis students to get involved in the practices of uh, changing our democracy. Um, but I I'd like, would like to provide everyone with an opportunity for a few comments in closing. And Sondra, could we begin with you? Yeah, absolutely. One, one of the things, Jane, is it'd be great if you all could have an army of um, teens um, who are stipend <laughs> to, work for, to work for you. I know my daughter became just, she's completely sold out everywhere she goes, and that's because she was able to, to work for you for a short time. So well, if, if we can get some that. additional funds from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, we'd be happy. <laughs> yes, we need to fund <laughs> that. It's an army. Because when they get it, they get it. And they, they just become, they're on fire. And then every place they go, they're just spreading their embers. So, um, but I just want to say in closing, you know, I am, um, my husband was in politics for um, de uh, more than a decade. And um, the first year of ranked choice voting here in Minneapolis, he ran for city, he was running again for city council. And then also, he also ran for mayor. Um, when it was a very contested um, race. And we got to see firsthand the transition of this community, of our neighbors, when ranked choice voting came in. So there were people who just, because of what they thought about, if you had a felony, and because of all of that kind of stuff, you can't vote and then hold, you know, and nobody listens to us anyway, again, many hopeless. When ranked choice voting hit, so we're talking about people who just didn't vote. Um, they felt like, oh, this might make a difference, even if we think Don can't win, <laughs> right? This could, could you know, put, put him up at the top. But we saw more, I've never seen more of a, a diverse group of people coming out to vote. This is 2009, that's why I asked you about that, Jane, who had hope that their vote might make a difference because of, and it took a little bit to explain it you know, because it was new. But, but anyway, with further education, um, we're, we're going to have more people come out who historically have not because they think their vote will count. They'll know that it'll count that time. And that was my experience. That was, you know, it got my husband elected the first time. Didn't quite make it for mayor. <laughs> um, but, um, but the hopefulness in that um, is just real and is palpable. So yeah. thank you. Great. Thanks. And thanks to your, your husband, Don, for his service to the community of Minneapolis. And we certainly have seen voter participation and engagement and communities of color and representation really foster under ranked choice voting here in Minneapolis and across the country. So um, the proof is in the pudding on ranked choice voting. And I appreciate you bringing that to light. Thanks. Um, Danielle, some closing remarks. Just it's so encouraging to hear about the good work in Minneapolis. You have so much hard work to do. I understand that. And my heart goes out to all of you for what you've been directly living through. We're all with you here in the rest of the country um, as you try to lay a new foundation for a mini a, mini a, mini a hopeful. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like mini a hopeful. Um, and so just thank you for this conversation. It's been such an honor to participate in it. Great, thank you. Stephen? Yes, I, I too wanna to thanks. thank you for, for honoring me with the opportunity to be part of this conversation with Sandra and, and with my dear friend and colleague, Danielle. Um, I guess the last thing that I wanna note is that um, we are not going home. The commission issued its report in June, but we are committed and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences is committed 
to sticking with this over the next few years because our goal is to achieve substantial progress on all 31 recommendations by 2026 when the nation will celebrate its 250th anniversary. And so we have identified champion organizations for each one of the 31 recommendations. And I'm happy to say that National Fair Vote is the champion organization for ranked choice voting. Awesome. voting. And with each of our champions, we are hoping to build networks of collaborators and to help bring philanthropic resources and support to a big mobilization and a campaign to reinvent American democracy for the 21st century. So stick with us on this journey. We will be sticking with you and thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you, Stephen. Wow, 2026, uh, we're with you. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Are. <laughs> A huge thanks again to all of you. We are so grateful for your insightful analysis and very clear headed resolve to make democracy reform a national imperative, which it is. We're all familiar with the refrain, elections matter. You've made that clear to us and that it's our civic responsibility as citizens to do what we can to move our democracy forward and change the rules of governing from time to time as the times require. So thank you for inspiring us. We are, uh, I personally um, am leaving this conversation more inspired than ever, and I'm hopeful that our audience is as well. And with that, I'd like to hand it back to Kim Nelson for a few closing remarks. Thank you all. Thank you, Jean. Wow, what an amazing discussion. I, I could listen to another hour of this group's insights, but of course we are out of time. Thanks to all our panelists, Stephen, Danielle, and Sandra, and to you, Jean, for your vision, your leadership, and your commitment to a better Minnesota. I'll close by thanking you all uh, out there uh, for joining us in this discussion of democracy reform. As I shared earlier on, there's, there's a lot of momentum here in Minnesota for ranked choice voting. This is one of the most doable and impactful reforms that we can take to create a more inclusive and representative democracy. Please join us as a supporter of ranked choice voting by signing up at fairvotemn.org slash backslash supporter. fairvotemn.org backslash supporter. 2020 is a critical election year, and we want every candidate running in 2020 to not just be a supporter of ranked choice voting, but be a champion of more voice for the people and commit to pushing pro ranked choice voting legislation forward if elected. To pass ranked choice voting this year in Bloomington and Minnetonka and statewide at the legislature next year, we need your time and resources. There are so many ways to help. Host an event, talk to your friends and neighbors, attend our events, write a letter to the edit editor, educate your legislators and local officials, or make a financial investment in this critical movement. You can donate at fairvoteminnesota.org backslash contribute. Whatever you can do, getting our democracy back is worth it. Thank you so much for being a part of today's discussion. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. And there will be a video available of today's discussion for those of you who have friends who weren't able to participate. Thank you all. Enjoy your day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.